Thank you so much. Uh, I feel very fortunate, very lucky that I get to be here to talk to so many super smart people about the science of stupidity. And uh, when I say lucky, I really mean that. I feel lucky um, because we're going to just explore a very specific cognitive bias that plays into the experience of what luck truly is. And this cognitive bias right now, it's in every one of your heads, and it's causing you to believe in this misconception. that you should focus on the successful if you wish to become successful. But the truth really is that when, you, when failure becomes invisible, the difference between failure and success may also become invisible. And the difference between failure and success, the scientists tell us, the evidence suggests, the uh, psychology is explaining, is that it's just really luck. And that's an unsettling thought. You can feel a little crestfallen about your achievements if you don't really understand what luck actually is, if you have a pre-scientific understanding of luck. And that's what we're going to explore. But first, to explore that, we've got to go back to 1941 to New York City in an apartment overlooking Morningside Heights, not too far from Harlem, where a group of mathematical soldiers engaged in statistical combat daily, creating equations that would both take and spare several hundred thousand human lives. You see, it was war. And in the build-up to war, the United States government realized that there was more information on the battlefield than they could ever possibly digest. No one person could understand a single battle because all these things had been introduced to the world that was just been introduced to common life and now was being used to engage in combat. You had rockets radar, sonar, ship-to-ship -ship combat, you had tank divisions, and you had uh, things that had just been introduced in the World's Fair that were now cracking open cities. And to modern eyes, what these people needed were computers. But computers in the day, of course, were just these clunky experiments made out of telephone switches and vacuum tubes, and they're very large, and there weren't very many of them. Or maybe they needed calculators, but a calculator was basically just this hybrid of a cash register and old-fashioned typewriter, not very useful. But they did have computers. They had all the computers they would ever need. It's just that in 1941, the world's most powerful number crunchers ran on toast and coffee. Now, they had plenty of these uh, number crunchers that ran on toast and coffee, and they assembled them together in 11 different research groups, each one with a different specialty helping the war effort. For instance, this one is the Philadelphia computing section. It was a group of all uh, women mathematicians who all day long, every day, all week long for the entire duration of the war, calculated ballistics tables by hand on pen and paper. So they basically amounted to meat-based mainframes. And these meat-based mainframes came together in a new branch of the government called the Department of War Math. <laughs> Which is not true. Uh, I made that up. I just think that would be really awesome if there had been a Department of War Math. I even had a friend make me this poster and it's hanging up in my house right now. Um, no, they were known by that very uh, unsexy 1940s uh, term, the Applied Mathematics Panel. And the Applied Mathematics Panel was kind of like um, super tech support, um, except it was, uh, instead of calling the IT department, a commander in the military called a mathematical genius who then was asked to advance his field, which would then later on lead to him winning the Nobel Prize. And, and in an effort to win a global conflict for control of the planet. So similar to calling tech support. Um, over the course of the war, and you've heard of all these things, the cryptology, uh, the atomic bomb, and things you may not have heard about, uh, torpedo trajectories, bomb sites, that sort of thing. That's what these people were working on. But as the war progressed, uh, they became focused on one problem, that is aircraft survivability. How to keep allied planes in the sky and how to keep enemy planes out of the sky. And the reason they focused on this problem is because aircraft survivability was something, it was, it was terrible. You had all these bombers making all these missions, and in the height of the war, if you're on a crew like this, the chances that you were going to make it to the end of the war at the height of the conflict was basically a coin flip, about a 50-50 chance. So increasing their survivability by just 1%, just 2% might turn the tide of the entire conflict. And that's what one of these commanders asked for. In fact, they went to the SRG, which was housed at the 
apartment in Harlem, and they had the great statistician Abraham Wald work on this problem. Wald had escaped the uh, Nazi purge, and his family had uh, died in a concentration camp. And he was bent on turning exponents and integers into bombs and bullets. And this problem of aircraft survivability was specifically suited to him because he was the greatest statistician of his day. And what he did was very complex, but he basically figured out a way to determine the survivability of an aircraft based off of how many um, bullet holes it had received over the course of a mission. And he came up with this chart that showed whether or not, uh, based off a certain amount of resistance, that that airplane would survive. And to do that, he created these little cards that were even simpler than this image right here. And the cards, uh, the ground crews and the flight crews would take them and they would mark down where the planes had been hit. And over time, you stack up all those cards, what you end up with is a crude heat map. And the heat map revealed that these planes were being hit mainly along the uh, fuselage there, out here on the edges of the wings, and on the tail gunner. And so the United States military, eager to put this in action, and this was, this was something that was really easy to understand. They grabbed this information and said, thanks for all your analysis, but this is the thing that makes sense to us. Let's go ahead and put armor on these aircraft. And they put the armor on the aircraft where you see the, the red circles. And Abraham Wald said, whoa, stop. This is a really stupid error you're making. And I imagine that they had their cigar and they kind of bit down on it and they squinted their eye and they were like, hey, well, what do you mean? And he said, look, these planes made it home. They made it home bullets and all, which means that the holes show where the planes are the strongest. You're forgetting that there's this whole set of missing data, planes that didn't make it home. And they'll show you where the planes can be hit and not make it home. And we can reasonably assume that that is where these planes were not shot. So put the armor where there are no holes. And that's what they did and it was the right decision and it increased survivability of, of allied aircraft enough that it did, in part, turn the tide of the war. Okay, so, pivot point. Um, I hope a question is rising up in the back of your mind. If the stakes can be this high, and you can have an entire department of war math devoted to keeping you from making stupid, ridiculous mistakes, how do they make a stupid, ridiculous mistake? And, am I making that mistake? <laughs> Uh, the stakes couldn't be that are not this high for me, so am I making this error? Yes, of course you are. This error is the result of a very particular bias that's in every single skull in this room, including mine, and we now know it by the title of... So if I can bring it up. Survivorship bias. Sorry, having a problem with the clicker. There it is. So survivorship bias is your tendency to focus on survivors instead of what you would call a non-survivor, depending on the situation. So sometimes that's going to be winners versus losers. It's going to be the living versus the dead. It's going to be uh, survivors versus non-survivors. And it's an easy mistake to make because, uh, could I get another clicker? The, uh, any process that leaves behind survivors means that the non-survivors are either destroyed or muted or removed from your view. And if that happens, then naturally, of course, you're going to pay more attention to the successes than you will the failures because the failures become invisible. And in the result of this, sorry, thanks. Try this one. Maybe thanks. Survive better. Thank you. <laughs> Not only do you fail to recognize that there is missing data, uh, missing information that might be useful in another set of data, you fail to realize that there's missing data at all whatsoever. And this pops up in all sorts of weird places, like um, there's this blog. Uh, by Mike Johnston, uh, called the online photographer, and he talks about how he's always uh, getting this, um, these people coming up to him and saying, man, they don't build buildings like they used to. Those old log cabins are really a great example of how to build a building. Uh, those old barns really show you how to build something. You know, all those old barns are beautiful, and, and, and they just really knew how to build things. And, and he's like, that's, no, that's not true. Um, most log cabins were crap, and, they, and they've all fallen down, and they've been destroyed, and you can't see them anymore. And the only log cabins and, and barns that I can take pictures of are the ones that are particularly well built. So your data is skewed in the direction of these survivors. And that's the sort of mistake you can make when you don't understand that something is missing. The, uh, another great example would be, for instance, let's say in your hometown you're thinking about opening a restaurant because all the restaurants in your hometown are wildly successful. They're super successes. 
But what you don't realize is that if you see a group of super successes clustered together, that's uh, evidence that that's a business you should avoid because they had to be super successful to avoid a hostile environment. And in this case, most restaurants uh, tend to fail within the first couple of years, but they're removed from your view when they fail, which means that you're left with the super survivors skewing your information about the world. As uh, Nassim Tlaib says, the cemetery of failed restaurants is very silent. But super successes boggle the human mind. And let's think about Brad Pitt for a second, okay? Uh, every one of us has a Brad Pitt-like character in our uh, profession. Someone who's very skilled, someone who's very talented, someone who's very driven, and so much so that they become known to everyone. And you want to get advice from someone like that because they seem to have it all figured out. But as Google engineer Barnaby James says, skill will allow you to place more bets on the table, but it's not a guarantee of success. And think of it like this, okay? For every one Brad Pitt, and there's one Brad Pitt, there were thousands, hundreds of thousands, people who came to Hollywood about the same time he did who were just as attractive, just as skilled, maybe more skilled, just as talented, maybe more talented, just as driven, maybe more driven, but some variable that maybe they can't even identify prevented them from staying in Hollywood and they had to go back home. So what's left behind is Brad Pitt, who is the one who was invited to shows to give advice, not this giant bank of people who could give you great advice on what not to do. He can't tell you what not to do because all of his decisions worked out for him. He's a survivor and they're not. So as he says, beware advice from the successful. And that's good advice. Because when we look at um, all these magazines that come out about successful people and what they're doing and how they got there and interviews about them and there are all these books that come out that tell us uh, the biographies of famous businesses and, or, or how certain businesses succeed in a hostile environment. All these things are looking backwards through hindsight bias. And this is advice from people who things all worked out for them. They can't tell you how or what, they, what you shouldn't do, what you ought not do, the things you shouldn't do and the mistakes that you make if you do the things that non-survivors do. That's why Daniel Kahneman, the great psychologist who won the Nobel Prize, he said, a stupid decision that works out well becomes a brilliant decision in hindsight. And what he asks you to do is think about all these companies that you know, have these interesting sort of fairy tale existences that have uh, become a tale that explains to you how you might want to run your business or how you might want to achieve success and go to whenever they were having the most problems, when they were at their most uncertain period, and see if anyone in that period of time had any idea how they would get to where they are today. Did they know that the decisions they were about to make were going to do what they did? And he says, when you look at it, actually, you, you'll always find that's just not true. And you're looking back at it with hindsight, and you're seeing certainty when in the moment there was nothing but chaos. And if you just group all of these people together, all these businesses together, and you see what, uh, what makes them all the same, what makes them similar, the only real answer will be luck. So we get back to luck. And that's only an unsettling and bizarre thought if you don't understand what luck really is. You still have this pre-scientific notion of luck. But we now have a post-scientific notion of what luck is, thanks to all sorts of different scientists. And most notably would be the work of Richard Wiseman, who spent 10 years studying lucky people and unlucky people. 400 different subjects of the course of a 10-year study. And he grouped them in several different ways. Sometimes they self-reported. They said, are you a lucky person? Yes. Why? Because this worked out for me. Are you an unlucky person? No. Why? Because nothing ever works out for me. And then they would investigate their friends and family and find, yes, there's this profile of a person who's generally unlucky. And there's this profile of a person who's generally lucky. And he figured that probably what's happening here is we're looking at the output of a very specific set of behavioral routines. And we just call it luck. Now, here's an example of one of his studies. He had a group of people uh, who had identified as either lucky or unlucky, and he said, okay, here's a newspaper. You have one minute. Tell me how many pictures are in this newspaper. If you can figure it out, I'll give you $250, no questions asked. But what he didn't tell them was that on the second page of the newspaper, in bold, big print, he said, stop counting. There are 43 photographs in the newspaper. And people who were 
considered generally lucky, generally lucky before the experiment were also the people who more often than not saw that. And people who are unlucky statistically were unlikely to see it, and they didn't see it more often than the others. And it played out exactly as he had expected. And the way he explains it is that um, it's what you would expect from lucky people because the harder they look, the less they see, and this is the way it is with luck. Unlucky people miss chance opportunities because they're too focused on looking for something else, whereas people who are generally lucky see everything that is there. You can group people by their uh, behavioral patterns. So unlucky people are people who are, tend to be very goal-oriented, and they tend to be narrowly focused, and they tend to seek security and control, and they prefer routines, where lucky people are open to new experiences. They easily abandon routines, change jobs very easily, they fail way more often than the unlucky, but when they do fail, they just shrug it off and move on to the next project. So it creates a really interesting uh, reality, uh, personality profile that he uses a thought experiment to um, demonstrate, and that is to imagine that you have a apple orchard. If I can get there. So in this apple orchard, every tree is uh, brimming with apples, and your unlucky person and your lucky person has a, have different strategies on what they're going to do to get apples from the apple orchard. The unlucky person goes to the same tree over and over and over again. It's safe, it's secure, it's a routine, it's predictable, but every time they go, they get fewer and fewer apples until finally they're not getting any at all. The lucky person, on the other hand, they tend to just go to a different tree every time. They don't care. It's just chaos. They're interacting with chaos. They're interacting with randomness and chance. Go to a different tree each time, Every time you come back with a full basket of apples, sometimes you may find a tree with not so many on it. Sometimes the apples are rotten. But imagine that these apples are experiences, and this person interacting with chance has more experiences from which to pull, and therefore when things work out every once in a while, they're more likely to have a thing work out because they have more once in a while. So successful people tend to make it more probable that unlikely events will happen to them while trying to steer themselves into the positive side of randomness. So. What can we learn from all this information? Um, I think the takeaways are, concerning luck, I want you to remember that luck is just what we call the result of a human being interacting with chance, and some people are just better at interacting with chance than others. And we call those people lucky. Then when it comes to survivorship bias, sorry, if I can pull it up. Uh, the advice business is a monopoly run by survivors, so keep that in mind. Uh, those who fail are rarely paid for their advice on how not to fail, and that means if you only learn from survivors, which is really all we ever write about are survivors, the only people who are ever invited to speak on stages are survivors, that means your knowledge of the world will be strongly biased and enormously incomplete. And then when it comes to success, realize that when you look for advice, look for what not to do. Look for what is missing. Realize that there probably is something missing. And I think that all boils down, everything I've said boils down to one idea, which is success is serially avoiding catastrophic failure, but routinely absorbing manageable damage. So that's why I feel very lucky that I had the opportunity to talk to you today. And that's why I see luck as an awesome guiding force in the universe. And that's why I'm thankful that we had something like the Department of War Math to teach us that lesson. Thank you. <laughs>